In August 2004, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelists in North America flocked to theaters to see Yu-Gi-Oh! the movie Pyramid of Light. Like the first Pokemon movie from a few years prior, you received a promo pack with a single card in it alongside your ticket purchase. This promo pack had four possible cards that you could pull, and then there was also an exclusive pack released around the same time that had eight guaranteed cards which was sold in stores. Most of these cards were designed for specific moments in the movie, so unsurprisingly they weren't the best cards at actual tournaments. This didn't stop me from shoving all of them into my childhood deck, but sadly the majority of these movie cards never saw play. Today we're going to analyze each card from these two movie packs to figure out why nobody played most of them. Let's start by talking about Blue Eyes Shining Dragon, one of the most iconic cards from the movie. This was actually the card that I pulled from my promo pack back when I was a kid and I still have it to this day. Blue Eyes Shining Dragon is a level 10 monster with 3000 attack and 2500 defense. It says, cannot be normal summoned or set, must be special summoned from your hand by tributing one Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Gains 300 attack for each dragon monster in your graveyard. When a card or effect is activated that targets this card, you can negate that effect. It's worth mentioning that this card was actually released two years before Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon was added into the TCG. Besides the fact that you literally could not summon this card for a few years, even when we eventually got Ultimate Dragon, the summoning condition on Shining Dragon was still not ideal. Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon was already pretty outdated by its release compared to the 2006 metagame at the time, so you wouldn't really want to play a card that could only be summoned by tributing exactly the Ultimate Dragon. In terms of its effects though, the attack boost might seem nice at first, but if you only have the Ultimate Dragon and three Blue Eyes in your graveyard, it actually summons itself at 4200, less than the Ultimate Dragon already had. The targeting protection was fairly unique for that time period, but unfortunately it was easily removed from the field with popular non-targeting cards such as Torrential Tribute, Mirror Force, and Dark Hole. Other than looking really cool, Blue Eyes Shining Dragon doesn't have a lot going for it. Next up, let's talk about Yugi's new boss monster, Sorcerer of Dark Magic. This is a level 9 spellcaster with 3200 attack and 2800 defense. It says, cannot be normal summoned or set must be special summoned from your hand by tributing two level 6 or higher spellcaster type monsters, and cannot be special summoned by other ways. During either player's turn, when a trap card is activated, you can negate that activation, and if you do, destroy it. This card must be face up on the field to activate and to resolve this effect. Once again here, we have a boss monster with a difficult summoning condition that has a pretty good on-field effect that I would say was ahead of its time. I do kind of wish that this card negated spell cards instead of trap cards, and I even feel like that's a bit more on theme because it is a spellcaster monster. Not to mention that back when this card was released, it was a lot more difficult to summon those two spellcaster monsters required for this monster's summon. Compared to Jinzo, a card that only took one tribute of any monster and could be special summoned with cards like Monster Reborn, there wasn't much of a reason to play Sorcerer of Dark Magic. And then we have Wadapon, which is just as bad as it is cute. At least in my friend group back then, this was the promo that nobody wanted to pull. Wadapon is a level 1 fairy monster that says, if this card is added from your deck to your hand by a card effect, you can special summon this card. In the movie, Yuki is able to special summon this card by drawing it with Pot of Greed. This card can also be triggered with card effects like Sangin or Witch of the Black Forest, but why would you want to? That's the main question with this monster. Yeah, it can be free tribute fodder, but even as free tribute fodder, there were better cards back in 2004. Not to mention that if you drew this card normally, either in your opening hand or as the game went on, you would be real sad to see this basically useless monster. The final promo card that you could pull was of course the actual Pyramid of Light. In the movie, this card was used as a counter to the Egyptian gods, but very similar to Blue Eye Shining Dragon, when the movie movie came out, we were many years away from a playable legal version of any of the Egyptian gods. For context, around this time we did have, you know, official and unofficial versions of the Egyptian gods with their blue, red, and yellow backing, but those cards were not legal at tournaments, and not because they were banned, but because they didn't actually have real effects. It wouldn't be until 2010 before we got an actual playable version of any of the Egyptian gods, and that was Obelisk the Tormentor. And that means 
means that with this card, it doesn't have any of the anti-divine beast effects. So the only effect on Pyramid of Light is a downside. If this face-up card is removed from your side of the field, destroy both Androsphinx and Sphinx Talea on your side of the field and remove them from play. Admittedly, this is supposed to facilitate a combo with the Sphinx monsters, we'll talk about that in a moment here, but even with that in mind, just putting a downside on this card and no relevant good effect is definitely a big problem. Let's take a look at the two monsters that Pyramid of Light mentions. Notably, these two monsters almost have identical effects with only one change, so we're going to look at them at the same time. You can pay 500 life points to special summon this card when Pyramid of Light is on the field. This card cannot attack during the turn that it is normal summoned or special summoned. This card cannot be special summoned from the graveyard. If this card destroys a defense position monster as a result of battle, inflict damage to your opponent's life points equal to half the attack of the destroyed monster. The only difference between this card's effect and Talea's effect is that when Talea destroys a monster by battle, it inflicts damage equal to half the defense. These are basically just two big beaters with a relatively free special summon condition, assuming you have the Pyramid of Light on the board. Now the issue with this was that none of these cards were very searchable by 2004 standards, but honestly even by modern standards too. And that meant that you would basically just have to wait around until you assembled all these cards in your hand. These cards would be a bit better if you could attack with them the turn they're special summoned, but they require too much setup and they have way too many restrictions to be playable. The big payoff for playing all these Sphinx cards is Thinian the Great Sphinx. In the movie, when this card is summoned, it goes up to 35,000 attack, but they dialed it back a bit for the TCG. Let's take a look at what it does. This is a level 10 monster with 3,500 attack and 3,000 defense. This card cannot be normal summoned or set. This card cannot be special summoned except by paying 500 life points when both Andro Sphinx and Sphinx Talea on your side of the field are destroyed at the same time. Then you can special summon this monster from your hand or deck. When this card is special summoned successfully, pay 500 life points to increase the attack of this card by 3,000 points until the end phase. I will say I appreciate that this card can summon itself from the hand or deck. There are very few cards in Yu-Gi-Oh that can do that. It's also kind of cool that this card does not require the Sphinxes to be destroyed by the Pyramid of Light. Even if your opponent uses a card like Trenchal Tribute or Mere Force on them, this card can still be summoned. But I don't want to praise this card too much because besides the fact that the combo takes three cards to set up, it also has one huge downside. Pyramid of Light was printed in 2004 and it never got a reprint, which means it was only written before Yu-Gi-Oh cards had a standard way of writing effects. Even when it was printed all the way back in 2004, how it worked was when the card was removed from the field, you would actually banish all copies of either one of those Sphinx monsters that you controlled. So if you controlled just one Andro Sphinx and no Talea, it would still be banished. And that means if this combo ever became popular, there would be an easy way to stop it by simply waiting for one Sphinx to be summoned and then hitting the pyramid with a card like MST or Dust Tornado. That's a clean two for one that not only stops the Talea from being summoned, but it also prevents the big payoff from being summoned as well. Furthermore, 6,500 attack is a lot less than 35,000. So while this card has a lot of attack points, it's not enough to game the opponent with one attack. And while that would have been pretty rare for 2004 monsters, I think because of how much setup this required, it would have been fine to put this card to like 9,000 attack. Next up, let's take a look at Rare Metal Dragon, a level 4 monster with 2,400 attack. This is yet another card in the movie pack that only has a downside for its effect. This card cannot be normal summoned or set. At this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, they had printed a ton of these types of monsters, level 4 monsters with high attack stats that had bad effects. And I think compared to a lot of the earlier released cards in that category, Rare Metal Dragon is one of the worst. The main reason people played cards like Goblin Attack Force was because you could normal summon it and out one monster very easily. 2300 attack is quite a lot. Rare Metal Dragon has 100 more attack, but you can't normal summon it, which means you have to jump through some hoops to get it on the board. And once you start thinking about those plays that get Rare Metal Dragon on the field, you start to realize that you could be doing those plays with other better cards, like Demok or Jinzo or anything else. Two years after this card was printed, we got Chainsaw Insect, another level 4 monster with 2400 attack points. But that one could be normal summoned. Its downside was that when it attacked, your opponent could draw one card. But that's not nearly 
nearly as big of a downside as not being able to be normal summoned. In the movie, Kaiba used Familiar Knight to special summon the rare metal dragon, and this is another card that they put in that pack. Familiar Knight is a level 3 monster with 1200 attack and 1400 defense. It says, when this card is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, each player can special summon one level 4 monster from their hand. In the movie, Yugi special summons King's Knight from his hand, but if you brought this card to a real tournament, your opponent would likely summon something a bit better. It would have been cool to see this card if it only summoned from your hand, but even then I'm not sure if it would have been played. That being said, because it summons from your opponent's hand as well, this card is virtually unplayable. Next up, we have Petten the Dark Clown, a card that Kaiba used, and this one is going to require a bit of explanation. Here's what it does. It is a level 3 monster that says, when this card is sent to your graveyard, you can banish this card from your graveyard, special summon another copy of this from your hand or deck. And that might seem pretty good at a glance. You know, you could use it for tribute summons, you could use it for synchro summons or whatever, but that's not how it works. I'll try to simplify this as much as possible, but there are two different types of optional effects, when you can effects and if you can effects. Now these days they don't print too many when you can effects anymore, but back in the day it was a lot more popular. And for these effects to work, they have to be the last thing to happen in the chain. This essentially means that if you use it for a tribute summon, extra deck summon, or a tribute effect like Cannon Soldier, it will not special summon another copy from your hand or deck. So it can pretty much only be used as a chump blocker for a few attacks. Admittedly, missing the timing is a very unintuitive mechanic, a lot of people have complained about it, and that's probably why they don't print cards like this too often anymore. I think Petten would have been a pretty good card back in the day if it worked with tribute summons, but it's unfortunately one of the cards that's really hurt by missing the timing. Next up, we have Inferno Tempest, and while this card didn't really see competitive play, it is a card that a lot of players have tried to make work over the years, and right now there are a lot of videos out there on YouTube where someone does successfully get this effect to work. Inferno Tempest is a quick play spell that says, when you take 3,000 or more battle damage from one attack, you can activate this card. Remove all monsters in each player's deck and graveyard from play. This usually is triggered by giving the opponent a 3,000 plus attack monster and then crashing one of your cards into it. This effect is big and flashy when it resolves, but it's not the most consistent thing out there. But it's a card that at least has seen experimentation over the years, which is more than I can say for most of the cards in this video. Finally, that brings us to Return turn from the different dimension, the only card in either one of these packs that saw consistent competitive use. It says, pay half your life points, special summon as many of your removed from play monsters as possible. During the end phase, remove from play all monsters that were special summoned by this effect. When it was released, this card could be comboed with things like the chaos monsters that were very popular back then. But I think where this card got really crazy was with age, it actually got better as the years went on. In fact, this card got limited in 2008 on the Emergency Forbidden and Liminal list that was meant to stop the Dark Arm Dragon Turbo deck, which could banish a ton of cards very easily. Eventually, in 2014, it got banned for basically being an instant win button in the Dragon Ruler deck. Once again, that was another deck that could banish a ton of monsters really early, so Return could help flood your board and OTK the opponent. And believe it or not, it is still banned a decade later in 2024, at least at the time of recording this video. Maybe they'll bring it back some day, but for now, you still can't use it. And with that, we have covered every card in the Yu-Gi-Oh! movie pack, as well as the exclusive pack that was released alongside it. To be completely honest, I have a lot of nostalgia for many of these cards because they were so popular on the playground when the movie came out. But unfortunately, outside of the playground, these cards really struggled at real tournaments, if people even brought them at all. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I'll catch you later. Goodbye.